<laughs> Wait, what? How much would your family income have to be before you started openly describing yourself as upper class? 32.5% said 1 million plus. Bro, over like three, once you're at 300K, you're Gucci, dude. You're getting like $20,000 a month, 10 to $15,000 post tax, post insurance, post 401K. Wait, 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 hold on. I'm sorry. I might be wrong. Okay. Okay, here we go. I might be out of touch. Warning, warning. It's off and up. Let's say taxes take 120K, so you have 180K. Mortgage and metros where people can pay that. $6,000 mortgage. Is that like a million dollar house? Hold on. Mortgage calculator. I just want to see what the I want to see what the payments are. Um Let's say that your house is a million dollars at 6% interest. Woo, that's high. Your monthly payment is 6,000 a month, but that's not including escrow to be fair. Probably about another $1,000, right? So Maybe, I don't know what escrow looks like. That's like a, but we're talking like, we're talking about almost a million dollar house here, okay? This is like an 800,000, so mortgage, so this is when you have an $800,000 house, okay? Student debt for interest and payments, $4,000 a month on your student debt? Wait, how, what are you, what are we, what are we talking here for student loan payments? What the fuck? How, how, what is that? Okay, let's, let's do the calculator of this. Student loan calculator. Ew, I clicked on the ad, hold on. Okay, let's say that we end up taking out, fit, okay, hold on. Average amount of in-state tuition costs. Because if you're going to an out-of-state school and you're complaining about debt, fuck you off yourself. Mel, you better not be telling me to be quiet. Oh. Um. In-state tuition and... We'll say tuition and board. We'll say in-state tuition and board. We'll say 15, I'll give you $15,000, okay? Say 30 to 60 grand. So we'll say $60,000 in student loans, assuming you didn't pay off anything at all. Um, more like 20K? Okay, I'll give you, I'll give you 80,000. I'll give you 80 grand. Assuming you paid nothing, no grants, and you did it all if, if you pay this off in five years, which I think is short for student loans, isn't it? That's at 6%, five years, no grants, $80,000. These are $100 monthly payments. Where the fuck are you paying $4,000 a month for your fucking student debt? $4,000 a month. Childcare slash nanny, assuming both parents are $4,000 a month in childcare? Oh, hit recalculate. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, we're much higher now. Okay, I was gonna say that that seemed a low. That seemed pretty low given car interest or uh, car rates. Okay, fifteen hundred dollars a month, more expensive. However, this is still a five year loan, which is pretty short for student loan uh, rates, right? Isn't it? Are these normally like ten or fifteen years? At ten years, your payments drop to nine hundred a month. Fifteen years, you go to six seventy five a month. If we go really aggressive, we could do this in five years at fifteen hundred dollars a month, though. $4,000 a month in childcare? You haven't bought a car or food yet. Definitely no stocks. Holy shit. Oh, Jesus. I'm too lazy to even fight with this guy on Twitter. I don't care, actually. Never mind. These are fucking Swedish tax rates, too? Bro, I need to get Molina's tax shit fixed. Oh, the immigration shit to the United States takes so fucking long. It's actually unbelievable. By the time our process is done, it's going to have taken like five years. That's with a lawyer, with both of us being decently wealthy, with her coming from like a fucking first world country. It's not like they have to dig through refugee papers or something. Five fucking years, actually unbelievable. Holy shit, dude. I thought you guys just got married? Yeah, but we started the process like when I lived in Glendale. But there's like a whole process that you have to go through with like your K-1 visa, all the paperwork, all the bullshit. And there's like a six month waiting period between every single fucking thing you do. <clears throat> Hasn't she been a PR for a while now? I don't know what the fuck PR means. Swedish tax man? The Swedish taxes are fucking brutal. It's actually unfucking believable. Holy shit. Have you taken her passport? What do you, why the fuck would you even ask that? 
Why the fuck do you think I would let her move here and keep her passport? Obviously, I locked that shit up on day one. She's never allowed to leave the house unless I give her permission to, which almost never happens. Steven Kenneth. Hi, what's up, babe? You remember that uh, event, uh, the uh, modern day debate event that we both went to? Um, the, the real life one that I was just at recently or? Yeah, yeah, the one in Texas. Yeah, what about it? Yeah, well, when I was in the hotel, uh, you know, waiting for the event to start, right? Mm -hmm. I saw you outside, right? Like waiting for your car. And I didn't know what to do, so I just took like a little video of you just standing out there, and I never deleted it. And I thought you should know that. That's so vaguely creepy, but okay. <laughs> okay, so the next thing, right? Yeah. Uh, so, so I was watching some of your old videos, right, where right. you uh, talk a little bit about, you know, socialism stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, you almost sound like, you know, you're super, like, aggressive, like, you know, socialism is retarded. It's, like, borderline as bad as fascism, if not just as bad as fascism. Mm -hmm. and, you know, it's, like, a terrible ideology. And then other times, like, I remembered when somebody asked if you would speak to, you know, Matt Brunig, you said, like, well, I don't know how interesting that would be because he'd probably, like, lay out his model, and I would think, you know, maybe that would work but you know maybe it would work in like 500 years from now when it comes when it becomes like politically viable but it's just not interesting to talk about right now to me those seem like sort of conflicting like attitudes right like is it the case that socialism is like retarded and horrible or is it the case that like it might work but you know it's just not that feasible so you're not as interested in talking about is it is Brunig a socialist i thought he was a sock down Oh, no, he's a market socialist, but oh, probably a variety. So he's not a socialist. I don't know what market socialist means. This means he's not a socialist, but he's just like, he wants like well, workers to own some of the means of production, I guess. So do you know what the, uh, do you know what a social wealth fund is? Um, yeah, like country invests some amount of money and then it goes to the entire citizens or something when they invest in their own companies or the country. Yeah, basically it's just a, it's just a state owned index fund, okay. right? Like the state has an index fund. And it basically buys up stock and companies and it buys up real estate. Basically, it's a state owned index fund that buys like income generating assets and then comes to own them. Right. Yep. And Brunig's idea is Brunig basically wants essentially all of the capital in society to be publicly owned through a combination of like socially owned enterprises. So like the post office, you know. And then, like, general government services, like, education, public health care, basically, like, socially owned enterprises, but you don't, like, pay a fee, right, um, mm -hmm. for the services. And then, uh, like, social wealth funds, basically. So ba the basic idea is we have traditional nationalization for some sectors, and then for other sectors where we still want the market to basically allocate the distribution of goods and services, we basically just have a market with competing companies, but all the companies are sort of, in the end, publicly owned through the social wealth fund. Um, and then maybe some sectors where we don't want the state owning them, like media, we have like media co-ops or something. That's basically Brunig's idea. Hmm. Okay, sounds a little cringe, but okay. So you would disagree with that? Probably, yeah, because I'm a capitalist, right? Well, you would disagree that that's a form of socialism, right? That, um, that's a fine oh, I definition. mean, it can be a form of, I guess, I don't know. Typically, when we're talking about socialism, we're talking about, like, expropriating shit from private citizens and, like, having the government, like, centrally plan like, and allocate okay. shit, like, generally. But, I mean, if you want to, like, if socialism goes back to just, like, having a social wealth fund or something, then if you want to call it socialism, well, it's fine. But. So it wouldn't be having a social wealth fund, right? Because, like, they're... You know, like, Hillary, interestingly, like, Hillary Clinton, right, in her book, argues for a social wealth fund. Alaska has a social wealth fund. Um, Norway has a pretty big one. Uh, but, you know, you could have a social wealth fund and not be socialist. I guess it would have to be that the social wealth fund, at least in combination with other institutions of collective ownership, come to own enough of the capital 
uh, such that it passes the threshold for being like a socialist country, I guess. Okay. Okay. So I guess that's that. And so you would disagree with like sort of that model. Here's another thing, I guess. So sometimes when you talk about socialism, one of your contentions is like, you know, this isn't interesting to talk about because even if it could work, this model is just sort of, you know, so far out uh, and it doesn't seem politically viable right now. So I don't know why you would talk about it. Do you think that that's sort of like an attitude that you have? Um, sometimes when people start giving me like their highly idealized socialist forms of economic organization, it's kind of boring to me. Yeah? There's not really much I can contend with because it's so idealistic. There's like nothing a substance to talk about because they can make everything like ultra idealistic in all of their examples. Oh, okay. I see. Um, and then I have to contend yeah. with the very real messy realities that capitalist economies exist under while I'm arguing with somebody's like utopia. And I'm like, this is just really boring to me. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. I mean, I think that if you're going to be a socialist, you know, given current empirical knowledge about like human nature and technology and so on could feasibly be implemented if there were the political will to do so. Um, I think you should at least be able to to offer that if you're a socialist. And if you don't, then, you know, it's like, what do I even, what are we even are supposed to argue about? Okay, yeah, so I don't think, I guess we don't disagree much on those points. Here's, okay, here's the last thing that I guess I'll ask about, right? Um, so with regards to your sort of, I guess, like rule utilitarian view, I think when you were um, talking with Nick Fuentes that, you became more left-wing because you sort of realized that a lot of people's positions in life are a product of factors that are like outside of their control, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm sort of, I, I am sympathetic to that sort of view. Um, and that sort of, uh, what you said there is kind of like a uh, expression of a view that's referred to as like luck egalitarianism. But I guess the thing about luck egalitarianism is that it's like explicitly a non-utilitarian position. Yeah, so you think um, it's contradictory to believe in luck egalitarianism, um, which, and if anything, that yeah, that seems more like a meta-ethical position to me. But you think that's in contradiction to any form of consequentialism, or at least rural well, utilitarianism? How? Why? What's the contradiction? It, not any uh, consequentialism, because like you could be a consequentialist and say that. Well, here, just tell me what, what is the of, tell me what the yeah, okay, what is yeah, the contradiction? Well, because I'm thinking are, there are some forms of like involuntary disadvantage that I'd probably be okay with. So, for instance, I would say it's probably the case that a um, a higher pro a progressive tax system disadvantages involuntarily people that make more money. But I'm okay with that, right? Yeah. So, I guess like. It, that's going to be like a little bit different because um, so basically the idea is like when I say that involuntary disadvantages are bad, what I mean by that is like somebody on, sort of on the whole being disadvantaged just because of factors that they didn't control. Like like paradigm examples would be, you know, people who are born like black having less opportunities in life or people who are born into a poor family not having the same opportunities for like flourishing in life or people who are yeah again um, i understand you know, all that but i feel like at some point these are going to be questions that are resolved on the meta level and not on the normative level now because like being born disadvantaged um and then being black or whatever like there might be a utility to having an equal society no yeah so okay so i mean and that would be but that'd a be a question of like what is like what do we consider goodness or what is a good type of thing but that would be like a meta ethical question not like a normative one right Normatives are just maximizing the goodness that we get from our meta level, I think. Um, well, I don't think I would. I don't know if I would, uh, if I like that sort of characterization, just because maximizing, right? Like, so, like, we'd want to say that, like, deontological views are, like, a nor those are normative ethical views, right? But deontologists, right, are explicitly not really concerned with maximizing the good. That's an No, but I'm just saying, if you were a form of consequentialist, if you were a rural utilitarian and you're trying to maximize any given good, mm -hmm. there, then whether or not, like, having black people as slaves, for instance, like, that might carry with it, like, some negative utility. Like, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, um, okay. I, so, yeah, so sure. Well, I guess what I would say about that is, like... Um, it wouldn't conflict with consequentialism. I completely agree with that because, like, consequentialism is just going to say we should maximize good consequences. 
I guess where I don't know if it's entirely compatible is when you bring in the utilitarian part, because utilitarian, utilitarianism, even real utilitarianism, is generally just like it's a consequentialist view, but then you're also adding another claim about what the good consequences are, and you're saying that the good consequences are the consequences where net utility is maximized, where utility is generally taken to be either like positive hedonic states or like desire satisfaction. I mean, I think the most plausible way of going about this is like if you're an objective list theorist, right? Uh, so objective list theory is going to say there just are certain things that are constitutive of well-being that are sort of like independent of your own mental states, right? So maybe like making some sort of aesthetic or intellectual achievement is just constitutive of well-being whether or not it increases your happiness or satisfies any of your desires. So if you're a objective list theorist about utility, then you could say that one of the things that's on the objective list is like being a part of a social order where there's no involuntary disadvantage. Um, I think that would probably, yeah, I think that that's the best way to square like luck egalitarianism with um, utilitarianism, now that I think about it. Gotcha. Okay, well, well, not to, you know, take this riveting sort of discourse away from your audience, but I guess that's pretty much all I had to say. All right. Um, well, I love you, buddy. Yeah. Uh, love you too, buddy. Have, have fun. Have a good game of D&D. Always. I'll see you later. See ya. Jeez. Okay. <laughs>